Aloha, and welcome to Books, 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 where we discuss reading and writing and everything in between and beyond. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Forsyth, coming to you on the Think Tech Network series, broadcasting from our studio in downtown Honolulu. Today, I'm not coming from my home on Maui, but I'm actually coming to you from Seattle, Washington. The title of today's episode is From East Garrison to the Ranch House. Joining me today is His Honorable Peter Gravitt, Major General, retired, former California Secretary of Veterans Affairs, and author. Welcome, Peter. Thank you for having me. I appreciate that. There's so much to talk about uh, with your life and your history and your book. Uh, you were promoted to Major General, becoming the first African-American in the 225-year history of the National Guard to earn the rank of Division Commander. And simultaneously, you worked in law enforcement. And then you were also appointed to be the California Secretary of Veterans Affairs. So, so much to break down and talk about. Where would you like to start? Well, I'd like to start uh, with, with my, uh, at, at my beginning and where I come from and, and then just travel through my life. Great. I, uh, I, I'm from uh, the South. I was born in the South. My parents were uh, sharecroppers uh, in the South and uh, pretty much uh, lived uh, the life of most sharecroppers, uh, picking cotton and uh, sharing their proceeds with the, with the landowner. And uh, if there were any profits at all after after a year uh, of picking cotton, uh, and my parents uh, lived in a county where the schools only went to uh, eighth grade for colored kids, colored children. So they decided to leave the south and, and head west, and they did. They they picked up roots with their eight children, uh, and moved to uh, California, settled in the Los Angeles area, and. Uh, I was very, very young at that age. Uh, and uh, I think I was like two years old. Um, and just a few weeks after my parents arrived in Southern California, uh, my father was drafted into the Army Air Corps, uh, leaving, my, leaving his wife and eight children. The oldest was 10 years old at the time, uh, leaving a wife uh, with a uh, no money, no savings, no car, no telephone, uh, but lots of uh, friends and relatives. And so uh, my father went off to war and uh, and my mother existed with her, her family. On his return, uh, he and my mother had, had additional children, uh, eventually had 12 children, one of which passed away shortly after birth. But they raised 11 children together. And- uh, well not to interrupt, but I'm so fascinated about your father's story. Can you share a little bit about your dad? Yeah, my dad was a uh, well, very honorable man, and uh, he was my he was my role model. As a matter of fact, he was the impetus for me joining the military because when he returned from the military, the only time I ever saw him in a military uniform was the day he returned home. And uh, I was very young, but I recall him coming into the house in uniform. And what, what struck me was that he removed the hat from his head and placed it on my small head. And I just kind of marched around the room like I was a soldier. And from that point on, I believe that's when I knew that I wanted to be uh, a soldier like my father. And eventually I became uh, a soldier, as you, as you know. And I think my brothers uh, also saw that too because eventually eight of my nine brothers served in the army how many eight of my nine brothers served in the army my goodness and uh well my two sisters got into the act also because one married a soldier and one married a marine so <laughs> we had a marine in the family and tell me about your father's role in the military well, my father was uh, was drafted, as, as I said, in the Army Air Corps, and he was assigned to the uh, 332nd uh, Fighter Group, which later carried the title of Tuskegee Airman. My father was an enlisted soldier and a ground crewman, 
and his role was to support the pilots uh, in preparation for their missions. And uh, and then when they returned from missions, his role was to receive them back and make sure they have all the, all the logistics that they needed for the next mission. That's incredible. It's it's an honor to talk to someone who uh, has so many military experiences and backgrounds. So let's talk about your book uh, from uh, East Garrison to the Ranch House. First, I want to ask you why that name? Okay, let me explain the title. Um, and on the on, on the front cover of the book is a a uh, photograph of the California State Capitol, and in the foreground are uh, colored people in the South picking cotton. I merged those two together to talk about where I came from as a sharecropper's son, and where I achieved uh, some success as a member of the governor's cabinet in California. And the title, East Garrison to the Ranch House, was coined because in California on, on the Central Coast, there's a military base there called Camp Roberts. And at Camp Roberts, in World War II, the colored soldiers were based upon the east side of the post called East Garrison, and the white soldiers were on the west side of the post called West Garrison. And on West Garrison, there was a uh, house, old hacienda that became the the, uh, the quarters of the commanding general. And uh, it had been a hacienda going back 100 years, of, of course, remodeled many, many times. And up until the time that I eventually took up residence in the hacienda as a commanding general, uh, no other Black or African-American officer had ever re resided in the ranch house. Okay. So my journey was from East Garrison across the highway to West Garrison to the ranch house. Amazing, amazing. So what inspired you to write that book? Uh, my sister, one of my sisters. I had uh, served in the police department for over 20 years. I had served in the Army National Guard for over 20 years simultaneously. And then later, after I retired from the police department and returned to full-time military duty for another 20 years, so I, I served a total of 44 years in the military, active and reserve combined. And in that time, uh, in both uh, in both careers, I had done a lot of things uh, that my family didn't know about because you know I was working in law enforcement, uh, doing things that police officers do. And then in military, I had traveled several places in the U.S. and around the world, and. And my family didn't really know all that I had done. So my sister encouraged me to, to put pen to paper and start striking keys on a computer to, to, to write my story for them, if, if nothing else. And so I really started writing the book for my family. And it was only toward, after I'd been into the book for over a year or so on and so forth, my sister suggested that I uh, let others read my, uh, my book. She had read the, the manuscript and some of the drafts. She said, well, other people need to know what you've done. And I said, well, you know, I, I'm not writing it for that, I'm writing it for the family. She says, well, the world is your family. And okay. so when I finished the book, uh, that's when the decision was made to have it published. And uh, and that's, that's the genesis of the book. Well, let's hear a little bit about from, uh, if you don't mind reading from your book. Uh, and I know there's, it kind of goes back and forth between law enforcement and military since you were basically having two jobs at once there. Yes. Uh, could you start with maybe something from the law enforcement okay. Well, in, in my law enforcement career, after graduating from the Los Angeles Police Academy, I served in a number of positions along the way, uh, uniform patrol, traffic. I eventually became a detective and uh, and served in uh, in public affairs and and spent a lot of time in traffic enforcement. And uh, traffic enforcement is 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 one that I want to read about uh, because you know all police work is not dangerous. Some of some of it can be funny at times and comical at times. And the police officer has to have a, a sense of humor to exist in law enforcement. So I'm reading a passage from my book of my law enforcement career. This is just one piece.
One summer day, while patrolling alone, alone in a beach area, the driver of a four-seat sporting red convertible committed a traffic violation, so I made a traffic stop. The driver was a young blonde girl, probably about 16 years old, and there were three other young girls her age in the car, and they were all wearing bikinis. I requested the driver to produce her driver's license, but she replied that it was in her purse, and her purse was at home. As I, as I began taking personal information, she attempted to get out of the car, and I requested her to remain inside. She exited anyway, as did the other three girls. I politely but firmly ordered all of them to get back in the car, but they just giggled as if it was all a lot of fun. As I was writing the traffic citation, with the limited information she provided me, one of the girls came up behind me and grabbed my uniform hat. As I turned to retrieve the hat, she tossed it to another girl, and they began playing keep away with my hat. All of this was being watched from across the street by a group of young beach party going teenage boys. These boys were friends of the three girls, four girls. The boys were clapping and, and edging them on. It was not funny to me. In fact, it was downright maddening and embarrassing. I radioed the dispatcher to send a backup unit, but cautioned, cautioned that I did not, did not require any assistance as that would, would have generated several police cars responding with red lights and siren. I didn't want that. When, it, when the dispatcher requested the nature of assistance I required, I chuckled and there was said that there were young girls playing keep away with my hat. Minutes later, there come several police cars, red lights and sirens blaring. Now I was totally embarrassed. I finally retrieved my hat and wrote the driver a citation for a violation of not having a driver's license and also for the, the, the uh, violation she, she committed while driving. I ordered her to lock the car up and walk as she would not be allowed to drive any further with no license. They all protested as they were barefoot and only wearing their swimsuits. I considered this payback. As they walked away just as quickly as I could, I left the area. No doubt the other officers would have preferred to have given them a ride but re refrained from doing so. At the end of the day, there was probably four pairs of blistered, bl uh, blistered and sunburned, sunburned feet. I, sus I suspect those young ladies really learned several lessons that day. Always have a license when driving, take shoes when going to the beach, and never play keep away with a policeman's hat. I too learned a lesson. Never stop a red convertible sports car with young blonde girls wearing bikinis. But if so, leave your hat in the car. <laughs> so that's just on the lighter side of law enforcement. And you know, in law enforcement, there are a lot of light, uh, lighter sides, and we need to always understand that. Oh, that's great. Yes. Oh my gosh. Okay, so you were in law enforcement, and uh, then you joined the National Guard, or did it was it the other way around? Well, it was the other way around. I, I went into the National Guard right after high school and uh, went off to the Army for training and served my time in the Army. When I returned from the Army, um, uh, I, I was a National Guardsman, and then I joined the police department. So from that point on, for the next uh, several years, um, I was a full-time police officer and a part-time soldier. And uh, somewhere along the way, I, uh, uh, well, I was promoted uh, to the enlisted ranks, E1, E2, E3, and finally, uh, I was a sergeant. And uh, then I made the decision to apply for officer school, officer training. And uh, I was accepted. And I went off to uh, officer candidate school. And uh, officer candidate school was very rigorous, as it should be. And I was on leave from the police department during the time. And uh, my intent uh, upon being commissioned as an officer was to serve in the, uh, in the tank corps. Armor, armor, armor branch, which I had served in as enlisted soldier. And uh, so um, 
if it's possible, I can read a little passage that occurred, something that occurred after uh, my training was just about over. Yes, please. Okay. And it's called the Field Artillery, the Elusive Branch. Just prior to my graduation from Officer Candidate School, all candidates appeared before a branching board to determine which branch in the Army they would be commissioned. Generally, each candidate will list up to three choices in priority, but it's up to the needs of the service which branch they would be assigned. In priority, my choices were field artillery, armor, which is a tank corps, and infantry. I specifically did not want to be branched military police as I had served there as an enlisted soldier, as an enlisted soldier. Each cadet was directed to report to the office where the branching board was impaneled to receive their branch assignment. The, the board consisted of, as I recall, a lieutenant colonel, a major, and a captain. Just as I was about to enter the room and within hearing distance, though not eavesdropping, I overheard a casual remark by a board member, a known witch, suggesting that I not be branched field artillery. And as I recall, his exact words were, field artillery requires a lot of mathematics and computations, and blacks lack that ability. The other board members made no comment. My minor in college was criminalistics, requiring several courses of advanced mathematics, and I was very familiar with the tactical and operational employment of, of artillery in support of infantry and armor units. I had a bachelor's degree, which, which uh, with, a, with a, a major in criminalistics and a minor in mathematics. Additionally, if that person had studied military history, past and current, he would have known that black soldiers had served in field artillery for almost 200 years. So that was just one episode in my army career, uh, uh, a negative episode, if you, if you will. Uh, but overall, my, my military career was very, very favorable. And I was able to get commissioned, uh, served in the armor branch as an officer. Uh, I commanded the armor platoon, armor company, uh, armor, uh, a battalion and finally a brigade, and this is over a period of years. I never did serve in the field artillery, but I found a home in armor. And uh, later on, I was able to uh, serve as chief of staff of a division. And then uh, uh, upon Senate confirmation as a major general, uh, I was appointed as a division commander of a mechanized infantry, infantry division. And all along the way, I had met a lot of great soldiers, a lot of friends, and enjoyed my military career. However, you know, I enjoyed my law enforcement career also, and that's why eventually when I retired from law enforcement, I returned to military duty full-time and was able to serve in several places. Well, we've had some discussions, and uh, I remember you saying that you've had a four-career life. What so, okay, so there's military, law enforcement. What are the other two? So military, law enforcement, and then also um, uh, federal and state government. So upon my retirement from the, uh, from the military, uh, I was appointed as the uh, California state chairman of ESGR. The ESGR is Employer Support for the Guard and Reserve. I was appointed by the Assistant Secretary of Defense and what that agency is, they serve as a conduit between uh, military reservists and their civilian employers to, to ensure that the employer understands the role of their employees do in the reserve military. And, you know, oftentimes reserve military personnel are mobilized and deployed, uh, moving away from their civilian employer. And there are certain rules and regulations and federal rules uh, in a, in a, that employers must follow in terms of rehiring or replacing the military when they return from active duty. So my role was to inter interact with uh, 
with employers, major employers statewide. And every state has this, by the way. And every state has this, uh, a state chairperson. And I was a state chairperson for the state of California. So that was my extent of my federal um, government uh, in uh, employment. And then a state, um, when I was serving as the ESDR state chairman, uh, I was contacted by uh, California governor's uh, office uh, about a position in state government. Uh, I had not applied for a position in state government uh, and was kind of uh, shocked that I would even receive a phone call. But uh, I was asked to meet with the governor, which I did, and uh, I was interviewed, and uh, that resulted in me uh, being appointed uh, as secretary of the California Department of Veteran Affairs, uh, an agency which uh, works side by side with the federal VA. Again, now the federal VA Veteran Affairs uh, provides all the benefits to veterans, but they are administered by the state and the, the state provides its own benefits to veterans. So as Secretary of Veterans Affairs, I had an agency of about 5,000 employees uh, scattered statewide, but this included uh, uh, eight veteran homes where that, that we house veterans in need. And then we have service centers throughout the state uh, that work side by side with the federal government. And uh, in that role, I was able to uh, work with work with veterans, ensure that they had their benefits, uh, connect them to the federal benefits, uh, ensure that the eight veteran homes were operated efficiently. Um, one home, which is the largest in the nation, uh, is in Yountville, which is in the uh, the wine country of California, north of San Francisco, and that particular home at the time. Uh, housed 1,200 veterans and uh, with about 1,500 staff members uh, total. And the facility was as large as a college campus. And uh, it wasn't just a building, it was a campus. And so I enjoyed my, my stint there uh, as the uh, California Department of Veteran Affairs Secretary. Boy, I mean, these are major, major careers. So my question is, how do you balance multiple careers at the same time? How did you do that? <laughs> With a little help from God. Uh, <laughs> uh, and also my wife. You know, when I served as, as, as Calabat Secretary, I've got to give a shout out to my wife, Blanche. She's a retired Army Colonel. And uh, she, she, uh, she assisted me the entire time I was a Secretary as the most gracious volunteer you could ever find. And she traveled with me. She uh, she spent time with women veterans. She talked to them. She she was a uh, a Joan of Arc, uh, and uh, and she did a great job in assisting me. But it was a challenging position. California is a large state, and from from tip to tip, it's almost a thousand miles long. And so, uh, uh, it, if you if you overlay California on the east coast, it goes from Maine to South Carolina. For example, and so uh, California uh, then and now has the largest uh, population of veterans in the nation. At that time, when I served as a, as the secretary, uh, we had two million veterans in California of wow. the of the twenty million in, in the nation. Ten percent were in California, and so our our work was daunting to serve those veterans. And we had, I think we did a very good job. But that's only because the federal government, the federal VA, and the state uh, provided sufficient funds to serve our veterans. Well, um, switching gears a little bit, I know you are writing uh, or have written a second book, not published yet, but can you tell us a little bit about that book? Yes, uh, I'd love to. The working title uh, is, uh, it's, just, it's just a working title, it's a General Patton's African American Battalions Fighting in World War II. And uh, the book talks about, it chronicles four battalions in the US Army in Europe and World War II. If you know the Army 
were segregated then and were white units in, in black, what they call them colored units at the time. And so I selected four units uh, that were different, totally different, that I thought someone would enjoy reading. One of them is a Barrage Balloon Battalion. People don't realize and hope to educate them by reading the book, uh, the role of Barrage Platoons, especially in D-Day, June 6, 1944. You've probably seen pictures of large blimps floating over the, over the beach. And those beaches, those uh, balloons were tethered to uh, a cable uh, stretching down. And uh, it was designed to thwart uh, any, any aircraft from attacking the soldiers on the beach. And those balloons were, were manned by African-American soldiers, the only barrage balloon battalion in Europe in World War II. Uh, another battalion I selected was an armor battalion, a tank battalion. And this battalion uh, had been formed in 1942. And by 1944, they still had not been deployed. They'd been training for two years. Uh, white battalions were formed and 90 days later, they were deployed. And this battalion, two years later, they were still in training because there was never any intent to deploy them into combat because there were no colored combat troops at that time in in the uh, in France fighting. They had some down in Italy at the time, but nothing in France. And uh, and so uh, the Battle of the Bulge was the largest uh, defeat. It was not a defeat. The largest intelligence uh, error that that we suffered in World War Two. Oh my goodness! My, it, I need to. I need to interrupt because we're running out of time, um, but I can't wait for that book to come out. You've got to let me know when that is published. I know you've got a publisher, so congratulations. And I just want to end with a quote, a couple of quotes that you've said to me before. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. And success depends on fortitude, drive, ambition, and opportunity wonderful things to live by and that's all the time we have and i want to thank you peter for being my special guest and thank our broadcast engineer our floor manager and jay fidel our executive producer and a special mahalo to our underwriters and thank you all for joining us audience and my book can be found on petergravit.com thank you thank you peter books 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 we'll be back next month and peter you were a wonderful guest Thank you for having me. Thank you. Appreciate it. Goodbye. 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 Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.